I mean, as far as the Ukrainian side is concerned, they weren't going to even consider that peace deal anyway. But this was Russia, if nothing else, rhetorically offering some kind of final olive branch to end the war. At this point, that's over and done with. We don't know yet what Russia's response is going to be. Um, if there is going to be in the same way around Kharkov, a way of you know occupying and controlling territory to create this buffer, this may be something that um, that Putin is considering. Right now, we are still in the process of stabilizing the Kursk front and pushing Ukrainian forces back into Ukraine. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and I'm back here with Dr. Michael Rossi, who is a lecturer at Rutgers University in New Jersey, where he teaches political science and international relations, relations focusing on the connection between culture and politics. You might know Michael Rossi from his own uh, YouTube channel, Michael Rossi Polsai, on which he keeps publishing very valuable primary sources in the form of uncommented speeches and press releases from the Russian state, making those video documents available to many of us who don't speak the Russian uh, language. Uh, he also has his own, he also gives his own commentary in, on, on his channel, and today he's here with us speaking from Tashkent to give us an update about what's going on in between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, Michael, very well, welcome. Uh, thank you for having me back, Pascal. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Well, Michael, we we were exchanging some emails and we said we should talk about the situation because you are monitoring the Russian uh, news media quite a bit. And at the moment, a lot is going on, right? We have had Ukraine's incursion into the Russian Kursk region where there are still troops are, are remaining. We've had New York a New York Times article that came out about the conscripts that were uh, that were taken prisoners from there, which I commented on yesterday, and I find that quite quite horrible that the New York Times did that. And we now have the the the, the, the all the war that's still going on in Ukraine, and apparently New York was just uh, the Russians just took that and other other places. Could you give us a rundown of what happened in the last couple of days? Well, um, you know, you had summed it up, I think, quite succinctly here. But uh, one thing that I need to make uh, clear is that official Russian media immediately played this whole incursion um, as little more than a PR stunt. Um, really, they had no idea why Ukraine was doing this. It was seen as a waste of resources at best. Um, a suicide run at absolute worst. Um, many of the commentaries had noted that Ukraine was sending in a number of its seasoned fighters, along with some of its more heavy weapons and equipment, um, with the intention, we understand, of reaching Kursk, and if not occupying the city, at least holding captive the nuclear power plant. Um, with the idea of using it as a bargaining chip, some kind of leverage in any upcoming uh, talks with Russia, which the Ukrainian government has uh, said that it is time to now bring Russia into the discussion. Uh, but without any leverage of its own, they needed to make this gamble, which the Russian official Russian media uh, thought was you know, absolutely um, idiotic, because there was no way that they were going to reach uh, Kursk, and that this would be a simple mopping up campaign that would take two, three days, four days tops. We find, obviously, that uh, a week, two weeks have passed. That has not happened. So the media has, you know, had to, you know, take a you know, somewhat of uh, a criticism, coming also from many Russians themselves, um, who were thinking that the, you know, the media coverage, I think, was too um, you know, quick and dismissive. And I will also want to uh, differentiate between official media sources and the various Telegram channels uh, that I follow, which, um, as we you know, just spoke about, the Telegram channels, you have to take with a little bit of a grain of salt, right? Because they are either very much pro-Russian, very much pro-Ukrainian, but 
many of the pro-Russian channels were very quick to criticize, even chastise the official Russian media for being uh, almost too hubristic in uh, this and saying that it would take um, anywhere from two to three weeks, maybe even up to a month uh, to stabilize the situation. Um, we find, and again, I'm going from Telegram, that the situation has been stabilized within the Kursk region. The Ukrainian forces are still there. But they're not making any additional incursions, while Russian counter-terrorist forces, along with uh, Ramzan Kadyrov's Akhmat's troops, are looking to uh, effectively encircle them and capture the border between Russia and Ukraine <clears throat> to um, isolate all of them and you know get them either to surrender or you know go down in some kind of guts and glory fight. Um, but there's no doubt um, either from the official Russian channels um, as well as the Telegram channels that uh, you know this is um, Russia's advantage that Ukraine made uh, an unbelievably calculated mistake in this, and that the biggest uh, loss is in life as well as valuable resources. Last I checked. Um, Ukraine has lost more than 1,500 uh, troops, along with um, a, you know, a number of armored vehicles, uh, tanks, weapons, among others. And again, I say that these are not just simply conscripts, that many of them are seasoned fighters, which deplete Ukraine's reinforcements on its own battlefields. And at the same time, the understanding was that Russia would pull its troops back from the Ukrainian side to reinforce and stabilize the Kursk side. That has not happened. We saw that there was some uh, readjustment of forces, uh, but Russia continues to make inroads uh, in Ukraine, specifically around uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. As we just mentioned, New York was uh, captured um, earlier today. And um, the now key city of uh, Pokrovsk is uh, still, uh, you know, in a gray zone. But uh, last I checked, um, Ukrainian uh, military officials were ordering uh, evacuation of civilians of the area uh, to prepare for the imminent capture of the uh, of the area by Russians. So um, I'm wondering, you know, ultimately, what was the objective, the primary objective of Ukraine? Um, making this incursion. <clears throat> and if it was done specifically for public relations to boost morale, or more likely to show the world, Russia first and foremost, that Ukraine can do this, and that Russia has weak and unmanned borders, then this was done as a way of humiliating Putin as well as the Russian military high command. Um, you know, it's at this point, there is no chance of them even reaching Kursk, let alone reaching the nuclear power plant. But the fact that they can do this, cause mayhem, um, and still successfully be there after two weeks, still sort of doing hit and run tactics, um, shows that they can be a thorn in Russia's side. And if they do pull back out, Another, uh, you know, another point that I was thinking of is that this could happen in other areas. They could do this um, in Belarus. They can do this in Kaliningrad, um, if need be. Um, they could make further inroads um, in various other locations. And if that's the case, then Ukraine is not as helpless um, or as fragmented as we would like to believe. Um, but that is, in my opinion, very much a reduced estimate of what the ultimate and original objective was, um, which uh, the momentum has now been, you know, absolutely lost. Yeah, some of the darker uh, interpretations of mm -hmm. what this phase of the war now means might be a shift from a symmetric kind of warfare to an asymmetric one in which Ukraine shifts more to guerrilla and, and pinprick tactics, um, and this might be the first of, of, of several ones. But again, it, the, 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 the fact that Ukraine is running out of people, that is the biggest, I think, factor in, in the necessity for some change to come, right? 
Um, the whole rest, I mean, even if there were more weapons from the West and the West is promising more of them, and even if there is the promise you can use them inside Russia, the, the current situation, the political situation is such that the West says we will not send boots. This idea was floated around two months ago, especially by the French, but this one was effectively shut down. That's what Correct. we know, at least for now. Um, the question then is now what is Russia's strategy in order to drive to drive the war toward an ending, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you, from what you see on Instagram, do you have any indications of where the thinking is going? Because winning a war or winning battles is one thing, but you might still end up winning every single battle, but losing the war by not achieving peace. Um, right. Do you see anything on the channels? Um, the Telegram channels still... Um, and again, you have to take the Telegram channels for what they are. Um, they have still maintained the strategy of just, you know, maintain the current momentum um, because you have that momentum. Eventually, this Kursk uh, incursion will be taken care of. There are still um, gains that are made um, on the Ukrainian side. Um, there has been no change, no change whatsoever, let's say, on the Zaporozhye and Kherson front. That has been almost now just a, an absolute standstill. Um, and there are still notable gains uh, in Donetsk and uh, Lugansk. Right? Donetsk is really the big one. Um, but what that still leaves open is this idea that while Russia makes gains within the East... Ukraine is still able to attack and hit border cities like Belgorod and may very well, um, as, you, as you say, and I absolutely agree with you, they may resort to more guerrilla tactics, right? They might resort to more, let's say, kamikaze uh, strategies, which may very well even include attacking the Zaporozhye uh, nuclear power plant, uh, making drone attacks um, against Kursk, and sort of eroding what they believe to be uh, Russian morale among the civilian population along those border areas. Now, we have to remember, I mean, Russia is vastly huge, and you know this is a you know, little more than a pinprick uh, within uh, Russia. The response among Russian citizens um, has been to you know, actively engage in you know, humanitarian assistance, providing a temporary location for those Russian uh, civilians that had been um, um, uh, displaced <clears throat> from the area, uh, from, you know, from Ukrainian forces. This may lead to um, some additional signups um, within, uh, within the military. It could, it very well could, and you know, this has not been um, discussed within Putin's uh, inner circle for an increase in mobilization. Uh, right now, Russia's uh, strategy, at least on the outside, is um, to simply maintain status quo. And this is a, it's a hiccup, but this is what happens in warfare. I mean, this was almost to be expected. Um, and so this is still within the framework of, you know, of, of military stability. As far as Russia is concerned, so you know, I think that um, we may be, you know, if if this is wrapped up within another week or so, uh, we may see that this was nothing more than just you know a bump. If Ukraine continues to send forces into the region, even if it's just to hold certain towns, in the same way that Russia is holding you know dozens and dozens within Ukraine, um, what this might do is show the West, uh, specifically NATO, that Ukraine is not yet dead, like its anthem opens up with, right? Ukraine is not yet vanquished. Because Ukraine has, um, arguably speaking, a closing window of relevancy. Um, you know, the election in the United States is coming up. Um, and it's amazing how much global politics revolves around elections in my country. With the understanding that if Trump wins, and I, I also have to say that since the you know internal changeover in the United States with Biden being forced out and Kamala Harris being brought in, his chances have went from almost a surefire victory to, I'd say 
at this point. But he still has um, he still has a good chance of winning if that happens. Right. The Ukraine stage, the Ukraine factor um, ends up becoming pushback to page six in the newspapers. Zelensky knows this. Sirsky knows this. Um, you know, the Ukrainian uh, government, they know this. So they want to make a show. They want to make a splash to make it look like that they are still relevant and can fight. Um, and if Harris wins um, and the Democratic Party is you know, going to continue Biden's uh, policy of just, you know, writing checks to Ukraine, then it shows that they still deserve to be funded from the West. And if the West says that Ukraine can do what it wants with the weapons that we give them, and we see no problem with them using them on Russian territory, which you know I have to say is pretty much as close to an open proxy war as I've ever seen before, um, then this, if nothing else, gives Ukraine the opportunity of, as you also point out, prolonging any sense of a negotiated settlement, to which uh, Putin responded to this um, incursion by saying the peace agreement that he had laid out for them about a month or two ago is now dead on arrival, right? So that's done. That's gone. Which, I mean, as far as the Ukrainian side is concerned, they weren't going to even consider that peace deal anyway. But this was Russia, if nothing else, rhetorically offering some kind of final olive branch to end the war. At this point, that's over and done with. We don't know yet what Russia's response is going to be, um, if there is going to be in the same way around Kharkov, a way of you know occupying and controlling territory to create this buffer. This may be something that, um, that Putin is considering. Right now, we are still in the process of stabilizing the Kursk front and pushing Ukrainian forces back into Ukraine. So in a sense, this Kursk incursion also was the burning of the olive branch or whatever it might have been, as in, um, no, Russia, no, we are going to fight this out. Do you interpret it in that way? Or might yeah. it just, in the end, just be something stupid? I mean, I at some point, Putin may offer another peace agreement, but it's going to come with even more conditions than the previous one, which unless there is just a complete collapse of support for Ukraine, where there's some internal revolution within Kiev, in which we see Zelensky, um, Sirsky, you know, and others you know, running for the Polish border, um, it, it's going to just simply be you know, nothing more than rhetorical. Because we have to think about this for a moment. Putin's peace uh, terms, effectively call for the reduction of territory in Ukraine. I mean, this is 19th century uh, peace terms that the West is absolutely, absolutely opposed to. If Putin in the beginning of this conflict had captured territory and you know occupied it just simply as a bargaining chip to get Zelensky to renege on any agreements with NATO, the EU, anything else. Ukraine declares neutrality. And at the end of this, the territory is returned to Ukraine. Ukraine is kept whole. Crimea is you know, a, you know, something else. The West may have pressured him to say, you know what, fine, you know, go and do this at some point. Um, Crimea was always a sticking point because that meant that we would, that Ukraine would give up um, any claims, uh, you know, any control of Crimea, which, you know, we, we talked um, earlier about no state gives up uh, territory voluntarily like that, right? And Serbia is still laying claim to Kosovo. Why should Ukraine, you know, not lay claim, you know, to Crimea? Um, but now with the addition of Donetsk, Lugansk, Zaporozhye and Kherson, um, there is absolutely no way that any government in Kiev would sign this um, unless they were facing, you know, total defeats in, in, in war. So the West has just disregarded Putin as um, nothing more than some, um, you know, military um, invader 
with delusions of grandeur. And so for them, you know, this this is not even on the table. Whatever peace agreement, whatever final proposal that the West comes up with, um, I'm fairly certain that there will be very little territorial change uh, to Ukraine. Um, and there's no support whatsoever, um, you know, for Zaporozhye and uh, Kherson to be included. I mean, by, by sabotaging that peace agreement, which was basically almost done in April 2022, which would have kept Ukraine as, as close yeah. as it gets to, what, to, to, to an optimal condition, it, the West now basically made any such deal impossible. And Russia would, just frankly speaking, it would be a dumb thing to do to say, like, uh, we give up unless they were, they were, again, losing militarily on the battlefield. And it doesn't look like that. So the problem, it seems to me now, is that we have a, that, we got, that we're going to end up in a, in a Korean situation in which you're going to have uh, you're going to have a border, a hard border, which at, at some point people will control. You might still have pinpricks on both sides, but no, no military way of getting getting everything. And yeah. then, uh, and then both sides will claim will lay claim to this to this territory, and this will will continue to poison Europe for the next uh, for the foreseeable future for our lifetimes, maybe. Yeah. Um, and and it could could be very well that we now see this other dream of the neocons coming true of Afghanizing Ukraine and making sure Ukraine uh, Russia has to continue bleed for twenty years or so um, in exchange for uh, for occupying those territories. Um, mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton spoke about this very openly. Uh, this is would be a very natural thing to do, especially if these people think about how the Soviet Union. Uh, last time was driven out of of, of uh, Afghanistan. First and foremost, how they were driven out of Afghanistan, right? That you could, that you continue this boiling, and you can keep yeah. this boiling on a very cheap and very low level, and it will continue to inflict hurt. Well, um, I know that the West likes to still think that Russia is the Soviet Union, and uh, this is uh, I, I just think a gross mis misinterpretation and a very careless miscalculation. Um, as well. Um, you know, uh, we've also spoken last time around about, um, you know, Glenn Deason and his uh, work on Russophobia, uh, which is a book that I still recommend, uh, you know, all of your readers to check out because it, it really lays bare um, the attitudes and the perceptions um, that the West has about Russia. So, you know, to this, to this point here, um, I have to give some, you know, some some bit of warning here. Russia today is not the Soviet Union in uh, Afghanistan. Um, the Red Army was heavily demoralized um, in occupying Afghanistan, which Afghanistan is very good at doing to any outside force. It will eventually demoralize any soldier, any army whatsoever. Afghanistan was foreign territory to the Soviet Union. Ukraine has some cultural, historical, moral, emotional value to Russia. And this isn't justifying any, you know, greater Russian claims of territory or anything else like that, right? But it is, it's a fraternal war between two countries in which those that are doing the fight on both sides, right? I mean, this is sort of a matter of, uh, of pride, of uh, of honor in that regard. So Russia is not going to be bled dry as much as the West would like to believe, especially when Russian economy is now growing, expanding. It has transitioned successfully to a wartime economy. Its military combatants are still largely um, either private organizations volunteer signups. There is not a general mobilization that you would find in Ukraine. You know, that's why morale in Ukraine is so low, because you see so many of these uh, soldiers that a week ago were walking the street at the wrong place at the wrong time, were basically picked up by, you know, the, you know, the military recruiters thrown into a van and shipped off to the front. Um, you know, they have no stake in fighting. Um, the morale is, you know, at, is comparatively far lower than that is uh, within Russia. So, you know, with that, morale is high. Territory is still being gained. Uh, Russia's economy is almost operating, you know, certainly separate from all of this. They can afford. They, they can actually afford the scenario that you uh, envisioned, 
which is a frozen conflict, a hard border, if there is any kind of negotiated ceasefire without any resolution after this, Russia can hold the front. Putin doesn't want that, though, because for him, that gives Ukraine time to recoup, reload, and um, you know reorganize. But if it gets to that point, one thing I can see within Russia is that let's just say that for whatever happens, Putin gets what he wants. He gets the four uh, regions along with uh, Crimea. What that does is it allows Ukraine to retain Kharkov and Odessa, which is vital for Ukraine's um, existence, especially Odessa, right? That gives the Black Sea access. But there will be hardliners in Russia. There will be the war hawks that may criticize Putin for stopping before he should have delivered the final blow. Now, can Russia do that is another story because their expansion, their territorial gains on the front is incredibly slow, which is something that we are not exactly sure, you know, either is Russia just not that militarily capable of advancing. You know, we like to think about Blitzkrieg. We think about American forces where, we, you know, my country can take a country in like, you know, less than a week, right? Russia has been doing this now for over two years. Or is Russia going slow and steady by going through another strategy, the grind, just simply grinding Ukraine's forces down to the point where they just get so tired that they'll just give up and be willing to agree to anything. Um, you know, that is something that is, well, you know, under lock and key. Uh, within uh, the Russian military uh, Ministry of Defense. Well, one of the things that we know about this, you know, what Russia told us even at the beginning of the war is like one of the aims of the special military operation is uh, the demilitarization of Ukraine. And there's two ways of achieving that. One is by agreement, the other one is by force. And one of the things that a couple of other commentators keep pointing out is that it seems that Russia was from the beginning, at least at least after April or like when everything was reconstituted toward a long war, was about getting rid of uh, of Ukraine's capacity to to threaten uh, Russia. And it, it's, the problem is, it's not just Ukraine's capacity; it's NATO capacity, right? Yes. And NATO has been shoveling in yes incredible loads of weapons. I mean, leopard leopard panzers and and whatnot, and all of these missiles, and and Russia is shooting them down. So there might even be an incentive to do the inverse, to Afghanize Ukraine, but to the NATO side. And the more weapons NATO sends in, the more the, the Russians will, will shoot that down and demilitarize militarily, not just Ukraine, but actually NATO. So uh, I that's just the, the, this, this conflict logic is now going into a way in which a, a prolonged, protracted conflict might actually come with strategic benefits on both sides or that both mm -hmm. sides might perceive as, as as beneficial do you do you see any of that going on yeah if uh, let's be perfectly honest here i mean ukraine's survival at this point is almost exclusively done because of nato um and you know, more so the united states um that's not to say that ukraine um would completely collapse but i mean they would certainly be forced as you pointed out um, within the first month of the war, uh, Ukraine was ready to sign a deal, um, the Istanbul Accords. And then uh, Boris Johnson steps in and says, effectively, no, don't do that just yet. Um, you know, we, we, many of us in the West are waiting for our, you know, military stock to, uh, you know, go up. You know, we're making money off of this. And some have even gone so far as to say that it's a good investment. I mean, you know, some of my less... Uh, uh, reputable uh, politicians have gone so far as to say it's a fantastic uh, way of we don't lose any of our soldiers. Our money goes in to have other people fight and kill Russians. And uh, we can continue to do this um, ad infinitum. You know, the United States, you know, you know, there's a reason why we don't have health care in my country, because we have all of this investment within the military industrial complex. So if it benefits the U.S., the U.K., Germany, Poland, NATO, uh, you know, as, as, as a whole, to continue pumping Ukraine with weapons that, you know, gives it the ability to survive another two weeks, 
then that's exactly what's going to happen. Will Russia be able to shoot the missiles down, capture the tanks, shoot that? Probably, probably. But what this leads us to consider is the only way to wear Russia down from the West is through a long protracted war of attrition, whether it's economics, which is what happened in the 1980s, which led to the, you know, the, 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 the internal collapse of the Soviet Union was that, you know, Reagan's whole approach is that I can bankrupt the Soviet Union, right? The capitalism can borrow money like it's no tomorrow and, uh, you know, communism cannot. So we're going to outspend Russia in military spending. Gorbachev has to respond in kind, and the entire system collapses. If this is the same strategy, which, again, many of the U.S. leaders still like to think that it's still the old Soviet Union and B, the United States is still existing in 1993, um, then it remains to be seen if this will work out. But it won't, the results won't, happen. We won't see anything for at least another two years, three years. And in that time, Ukraine just continues to just be turned into a crater. Um, you know, tens of thousands will, you know, either flee the country or get destroyed in the war. I mean, you know, to the West, Ukraine is the pirate, uh, you know, victory to solidify NATO and uh, to, I don't know, cripple Russia. But I mean, it's 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 a horrible victory. Uh, one without any real morals, in my opinion, but, you know. No, the, the horrible the horrible thing is that the people in the West who shout the most that they want to save Ukraine, they are willing to sacrifice as many Ukrainian as it takes. Yes. I mean, the, the same people who tell us that we must do everything to help Ukraine are the same people who tell us that we must now think about sending Ukrainian men back to go and serve their country. And they, I mean, it's, it's, it's mind boggling and it, it's yes. sickening. To, to which extent these people are willing to drag mm -hmm. out this war. But mm -hmm. it leaves us with the question, and I discussed that with Glenn Deason uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, what, is the counter, what is the counter strategy, especially if we suppose that this hurts the Russians more and that the Russians would be the ones who want to drive the war down and get to this situation that you know, the United States got with Japan. I mean, that was fantastic, right, how the U.S., won a victory and you and Japan surrendered, surrendered. And a few years later was was the best ally of the United States ever and remained so for 70 years. That should be the goal, right? For the Russians with Ukraine. But it's very hard to see how to pull that that one off um, as long as these as these uh, weapons and unconditional support keeps keeps flowing in. So right. probably it is outside of the the political abilities of the, the 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 political process inside Ukraine to do so, and it will depend upon whether weapons flow or not. If you get to a to a condition in which even the ultra right wing nationalists would be willing to cut a deal with Putin in order to preserve statehood. Well, within within this context, I, I was remembering there was an article written in the early '90s by uh, James Fearon, and I don't remember the the title. Uh, particularly offhand, but he focuses on what's called commitment problems or commitment issues within foreign policy. And the, the gist of it is that countries like the United States, or even more so liberalist states, states that operate within, with a, you know, with a, within the liberalist principle of ideology, we are out to save the world from the, from the tyrannies of evil. It's very difficult for them to suddenly reverse gears and it go from we will defend Ukraine's right to enter NATO. Ukraine is, you know, uh, you know, fighting against, um, you know, Russian expansionism to all of a sudden then cutting a deal. Right. It, it just doesn't happen. It, it just doesn't happen, even though it might be militarily strategic. It might be economically beneficial. You you just don't do that when you sign up for an objective. You'll burn the country to the ground in order to achieve that objective. And so while there are those in Russia and those that are more on the pro-Russian side that think all that it takes is um, you know, a grinding down of resolve in Ukraine or a changeover in leadership um, or some one you know, momentous event that gets the West to change their uh, strategy. 
it would have to be an unbelievably major event, like the use of nuclear weapons or something like that, right? Um, or a Trump victory uh, coupled with, um, you know, the collapse of centrist governments across Europe. Um, you know, Macron is out, Mélenchon comes in, AFD comes in, um, you know, Starmer's government just completely collapses in uh, the UK. And, you know, all you have left are, you know, Poland and the three Baltic states that are willing to fight and no one else is willing to do so. Um, in order for that to happen, I mean, there just has to be just major, major, just a systemic revolution uh, within Europe and within NATO. And if that doesn't happen, they're going to continue to pursue this, especially if the war is outsourced. If they don't lose any of their own specific material, I mean, Ukraine is expendable. And if it ultimately means that Russia will tire out before the West does, then mission accomplished. Um, there. I think also, I, I think I want to add this I, because you mentioned um, Japan. You mentioned, I was thinking about even Vietnam. Uh, for that matter as well right vietnam could have it could have america could have continued vietnam for as long as possible um but you know finally it was nixon that said okay you know this this we can't win um and it's very difficult for the united states to admit defeat um you know afghanistan did and it's you know what we just we we the narrative for us was well, we achieved our original objectives anyway 20 years ago by getting al-Qaeda out of Afghanistan, which is, again, it's like, listen, if you're going to gaslight, you need to be a little bit more effective in this. But isn't it interesting that nobody talks about Afghanistan anymore? And we quickly shifted gears towards Ukraine. Uh, Afghanistan wasn't worth it, but this one is going to be worth it, right? Or, or, you know, or something like there's a major war that happens between Iran and Israel, which forces us to shift gears away from Ukraine and focus on that. But other than that, the commitment issues, commitment problems are things that lock a country's foreign policy into something. You would, you, you, you say you're going to do this, and they're backing out ruins your reputation. Yeah. But it's another thing, it's commitment, absolutely right. But the second thing is what you just mentioned, and that's attention. As long as attention can be focused on a point, the, the, the incentive, the reputation incentive to not let, it go, let go of the failed policy is super high. But you know the way that we have seen in, the, in which the Ukraine war basically became the next Afghanistan and completely crowded out Afghanistan, even though Afghanistan was at that point in, in a super dire situation, which it still is, and then put immediately on the sanctions and so on, but crowded out. It also crowded out COVID <laughs> that ended, right? In, 2019, in 2020, 2021, there was just no ability to focus on a war because we were, we were, we were busy with another one, uh, the one against COVID. And yeah. So in, in the same sense, there's now this, this factor in the Middle East um, that we're still waiting for the response of uh, Iran. And there are reports that Russia is actually helping Iran now with missile defense system and, and whatnot, and that Iran is actually now building up the, the, the actual capacity of fighting a war with uh, Israel and, and by extension with the United States, although that one will look very different. Because if one thing is clear, it is that the U.S. will not be willing to sacrifice Israel the way that it was willing to expend the entirety of Ukraine. I mean, yes. Israel has a completely different, it's a, diff, it's a completely different animal, right? Yes. Um, yes. That's what we've learned yes. now. Um, it's rather Israel that has the United that 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 has power over the U.S. political process and not the inverse, which will mean that the war fighting will happen in a completely different way. But in your sources, what you're reading from the Russian media, uh, nor, uh, um, traditional media and telegram channels, what about the factor in the Middle East? What, what, what do the Russians think about that one? Russia has played a very um, legalistic neutral role. First, they openly support the existence, the creation of a Palestinian state. Right, with East Jerusalem as its capital. Now, that's easy enough to say, but creating such a state involves 
going to war with Israel. I mean, there's no other way around this, right? Israel is not going to allow this to happen, especially when they're going to say, well, if this happens, what about all of our settlers? To which, you know, the rest of the world will say, you know, to hell with your settlers, you know, okay, go out. That's not going to happen because the United States is going to prevent that, right? I mean, Israel, you, 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 it's, so, I, it's, it's hard to say who controls who in all of this. I think it's symbiotic. Where Israel knows that it has a green light from anyone who's going to win in November. If it's Trump, Netanyahu can final solution on the Palestinians. If it's Harris, it's just going to have to be pulling your punches. But there will be no real pressure on Israel. There might be some rhetorical things, but other than that, it's Netanyahu, the Israeli government, the Israeli uh, political elite know that they are protected by the United States. And as you also point out, if there is a war that breaks out, the United States will get itself involved. They might not put boots on the ground, but they will defend Israel to the end. There are two countries that the United States will absolutely positively give carte blanche support to in the world, the UK and Israel. There's no question. Every other country, there's an expiration date on that, right? There's an expiration date. Some a little bit more than others. Russia's whole response to all of this is first creation of Palestinian state, but a two-state solution in which Palestinians live alongside that of Israel. So Russia is, you know, certainly not uh, with Iran calling for the end of the Israeli state. Russia has good relations with uh, the Israeli government. We have to remember that there are a lot of Russians that live in Israel. So they're taking much more of a structural approach to the Middle East. However, their support for Iran also comes more so with economic and infrastructural reasons. Iran is now a member of BRICS, along with Saudi Arabia. We tend to forget this, right? We tend to think, right, that the Gulf states, the Arab states are going to side with um, Israel and the United States. Not as much as they used to. I don't know. The we haven't seen this play out, but BRICS has expanded. And Iran is a major ally of this. And this may also lead to, God, I hope it doesn't happen like this, but I'm thinking more and more about how alliance networks are uh, sort of building up to what it was around 1914. Yeah. Um, you know, where all it takes is some stupid Austrian visiting some godforsaken Balkan city on, on the wrong holiday, and bang, bang, off we go, and alliances go here, here, here. Um, will this drag Russia into a conflict in the Middle East? Will this drag China? Will this drag, we haven't even talked about China, um, what the United States might do in waging, you know, open economic wars, or whether Taiwan comes into the equation, if something it blows up in the Middle East like that, or China, I mean, Ukraine becomes, you know, no longer the trending hashtag, which they know. I think this is why Zelensky was also trying to do something in Kursk, is to make Ukraine back on the front page. Give some people this idea that Ukraine still has uh, the some kind of tactical event. And if nothing else, just to give Russia a bloody nose, you know, to go down fighting, uh, you know, as you said, with, you know, more um, guerrillas like tactics, kamikaze. Uh, you know, type warfare that, you know, inflicts a number, you know, some serious damage on on uh, on Russia. So, you know, we're sort of jumping around here. I know you, you we were talking about the Middle East. I was bringing in China, um, you know, all no, of this. They belong together. This belongs together. I mean, yeah. as sad as it is, but we are getting closer and closer to a world war, uh, not one that explodes one at a, one at a time, but little by little, which is yeah. actually the Second World War it didn't start in I mean, didn't become a world war in 39, 39 to 41. It was a European war. And then yeah. it, it expanded because of what Japan did on the other side. Yeah. Um, but but the, so my, my question then is whether there is a strategic interest in Russia to maybe say that, you know what, Iran fighting would actually be not too bad for us. Um, let's, let's pay the Americans back the way they try to pay us. Have you ever heard anything of that? I hope not. <laughs> No. Um, uh, if, if it has, it's not the Telegram channels that I've been following. Um, and I don't uh, I, I don't 
read the comments. I just read the articles. Sometimes I just check the comments to see um, the, co you know, the, the, the comment sections are usually from the most hawkish type of people. But, you know, these are comments from ordinary yeah. Telegram users. Yeah. That's it. So, no, no, no. We haven't gotten to that point yet. And I hope that we never do. No, because the last thing we want is this, is this spreading. But the, the problem is that the logic, the logic of warfare, and, and especially when war becomes systemic, the way that we are nearing now in Ukraine, again, if the, if the grinding down of the other one becomes something that both of them want, then you keep it alive for mutually beneficial purposes, which right. is a sick, it's a sick thing to happen, but it can happen. But you know, it, 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 what's, what, what is even more problematic about this is that the momentum to keep this going is rooted within American liberal foreign policy. Um, you know, this, this idea that the ideology of America, and I, I'm saying this just because the United States is the most influential out of all of this, right? If yeah. France or the UK had the capability, they would do so as well. <clears throat> but there is this messianic crusading zeal to, if not democratize and civilize parts of the developing world, prevent the hegemonic rivals from gaining a foothold. And right now it's Russia that is seen as the, the, the most vocal ideological rival, but China is the bigger economic one. Right. China's foreign policy is still very quiet. You know, Russia is kind of like, you know, the, the loud one in the room and China is the sleeping dragon. But both of these countries have become closer and closer and closer together um, in which any efforts by the United States to wean one away from the other, I think, have failed. I mean, there's just no way around that. And you're absolutely right in that we may very well see a series of conflicts that take place, in which the United States and NATO, the UK, um, are all part of it because of their desire to maintain some kind of ideological momentum, or if nothing, if nothing else, if nothing else, if we pull back from Ukraine, Russia wins. If we pull back from Taiwan, China wins. If we pull back from Israel, Iran wins. And we can't let that happen. Goddamn, goddamn zero sum thinking without any kind of shared interest and shared prosperity. But this is what's good. This is what's ruining us right now. Uh, I wish we could we could end on a happier note, but uh, <laughs> the world is what it is. Michael Rossi, Michael Rossi Polsai, follow him on YouTube, follow him on Twitter. You're on Twitter. Yes, you are on Twitter. I am. I, I do have a Twitter account. Yes, yes. <laughs> I see. I see. I, 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 it, it pops up sometimes. Follow him yes, there. Yes, it does. And uh, any other place to follow you? Um, well, Instagram, but that's just solely photography. It's just it's it's my happy place. I, there's no politics. <laughs> there's no politics there. Everybody keep a happy place. Michael Rossi. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Pascal.